just want to get into today's message and teaching, and it's really this message is how to rebound from a failure, and that every one of us go through life and go through failures. It's just part of living because we're human beings. We all make mistakes. We all have failures. But the secret is God doesn't want you to be defined by the failure. He doesn't want you to be limited by the failure. He doesn't want you to be restricted by failure. He wants you to come out of that because he says he can take all things and turn them to good. And then out of that, how do you rebound? And so as I thought about that, this is a, a applicable for every one of our lives because I'm not even going to ask you, have you failed? I know you have. And will you fail again? Yes, I know you will. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. But he's the one that changes everything. So I'm going to give you some principles. And when we look at this, it comes from the story of, of Peter. One of really the Peter was just getting to know Jesus a little bit. He, Jesus had begun his ministry. He was teaching some in the region. People were he was probably the talk of the town, and people were gathering, and maybe things were happening and just life. And so here he comes. Peter hadn't been called to be his disciple. This is a kind of the moment where he's getting this revelation to follow Jesus. And so he's been out fishing all night long. And the way they fish in that culture, it's a great big lake. Pastor Barb and I have been there to Israel, and it's amazing. That's why you hear these storms. It's not an ocean storm, but it's so big that when the waves, they can get, you know, humongous and shipwreck, and it's dangerous, and you can't even see the other side. It's so far. So this is like a very big, large body of water. And so Peter goes out at night. He's a professional fisherman. This is his income. This is his job. And he's been out fishing at night with nets because in that place, those fish in that place, they needed nets. And when they did, they fish could see the net during the daytime. And they see the net and they would run away from it. And so they couldn't catch them. So they always fished at night and they always had this. And so Peter's gone out. He's not caught anything. He's went at the perfect time. And now he's at a place where he's coming back and he's pulled up to the shore. And Jesus wants to get in his boat to teach and he pulls away, and this is a perfect place of teaching because the scientists have studied it. When you're stand, sitting on the water and the people then could surround him, his voice would reflect off of the water. It's like perfect acoustics. So this was not only just to get away from the crowd, but so that the crowd could hear him. And this is what we find in Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 3. It said, Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And that's really, his name is Peter. He calls himself Simon, but and at this point later, he just began to keep the name Peter, but Simon Peter. And he asked him to go a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep water and then let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. In other words, he was already trying to like explain to him, but he didn't stop there. He didn't argue with him. He didn't resist him, but he responded. Look what he said. But because you say so, I know that it's impossible to catch fish. I know we won't catch fish. But I'm going to do what you say do. And this is a key principle in every part of our rebound. Because Peter had failed all night long. And now he's coming back to a place of great success. Look what it says. I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Let's say that together. Do not be afraid. This is an amazing passage. We kind of read through these words and we don't think about them. But at this moment, he's telling him that there's a shift in this. There's a failure here, but there's a rebound coming. And out of this, there's a new calling in our life. There's a new thing you're going to begin to catch a great harvest. Just like you saw this fish, you're going to see a great, great harvest and I don't want you to be afraid because you're going to have to move in faith and take some actions here. And so do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so they pulled their boats up on the shore. And they left everything and followed him. 
And that's really a powerful story and we see in his life and how he became such a great apostle and used by God in many ways. But Peter was always a very impetuous kind of guy. He had a big mouth. He talked too much. He acted too soon. He did things you know, all the time. He had a lot of failures. He's the guy that denied Jesus. I mean, we could just spend days just studying Peter's failure. But every time he learned to rebound with Jesus, and that's the secret. And what made the difference between the first night of fishing without catching anything and then the next day of fishing with only one net drop, with only one time of fishing, he caught a great, great harvest. What was the difference? And that's what we're going to look at is we're going to break this down. And the first thing that was different was we, he, Jesus got into his boat. You know, he got into his presence, and that's really the secret that in all of our lives, when we go through failures, in fact, we're going to live in failures, we need to stay in his presence because he can take failures and turn them into great successes. But he got into Jesus' presence, and when Jesus comes on the scene, it changes everything because nothing's impossible with him. And that's really what we've got to do is put ourselves into the presence of God and, and come and push into his presence, get in his presence. And as I thought about that, I reminded of a story that I also remember about some other guys that had a failure. And that was a, a guy that was paralyzed. This was a man that was paralyzed. Now the word of Jesus, he had start doing these healings and miracles. And every time he went preach, people got healed and delivered and, and lives were changed. And so he had four friends. And I, we don't know the story. Did this guy, like, ask his friends or did his friends, you know, come out? But we, we got a story of four friends. And so they came to this house and they went and got their crippled friend who was paralyzed. And they had him on a mat or some kind of plane to carry him in. But they couldn't get into the house because now the small house and it was totally packed with people. And it says then, we see it in Mark chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, since they could not get him to Jesus. See, their goal was to get him into Jesus' presence. That any time we get into his presence, when we get close to him, when we touch him, that's when he touches us. They could not get into him because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging down through it, lowered the mat of the paralyzed man lying there. And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your, sons, your sins are forgiven. Now, just kind of to give you a kind of illustration, uh, we've seen these uh, types of structures all over the world in Africa and, and Mexico among the Maya Indians. But a lot of places in Israel, I mean, we kind of have our visions of the mud and the second floors. And they are some places built second floors and, and had roofs, you know, that Peter went on to. But this is like one of the many houses, it was probably a thatched roof. In other words, they put poles up and then they take some type of thatching like palm, date palm branches. And then they, they line the roofs and then they put this thick thatch on there. And it becomes actually very waterproof, very long lasting, very great and uh, very cool in the summer and warm in the winter. So it's a perfect kind of situation that you see. So what they did was they had this thatching up there. So they went up to the roof and then they started digging down through it. I don't know about you, but I don't know who, what the house owner thought about this. I'd be like a little bit ticked, like, wait a minute, that, that roof has took a lot of work to put up there, you know, and who's going to fix this hole and whatever. But see, they didn't let what other people thought stop them. They didn't let this, you know, rejection. They didn't let, you know, worrying about what people would say or what it would look like because that's not normal. You're supposed to go through the normal ways. You're supposed to come through the normal door. And that's really what's great about getting a hold of Jesus. That's what we do around here. We're looking for the new ways to get to Jesus and to get other people to Jesus. It's an amazing thing, too, if you look at this, this story. You see these guys, they're digging down through there. And it said, you know, when you think about it, the power of what happened, this man was first forgiven and then he was healed. You know, this is an example, a very clear example 
of a small group in action, amen? This is like the friends gathering around them, you know, like, man, we're praying for you, we're believing with you, and we know that God is gonna do something because we've seen him do it through other people. And so that's really why you need to, if you're not in a small group, come out here on Wednesday night. It's only six weeks long. Be a part of the Quick Connect. Sit around, talk about the message and apply it, and then pray for one another throughout the week. You'll have a powerful experience. This is a good example of a small group putting faith in action. But it's amazing when you hear what Jesus said. It said, Jesus saw their faith. How do you see faith? You see faith because you see it in action. Amen. All through the scriptures, we see people and, you know, there was faith and there was always a place of action. We think faith is just believing something. In fact, a lot of people think faith means I'm hoping for something. Faith is I'm wanting something. And that's not what the scriptures talk about. It's not what you want, not what you hope, but what you know that God is involved in and believing, but then acting in response to that. See, they had determined actions. They weren't going to let the crowd there. They weren't going to let the door full. They were not going to let the rooms full. They were going to say, what can I do to get into the presence of Jesus? And when they did, something supernatural happened. And they had a visible action of faith. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about and seeing today at the end of this message is people taking a visible action of baptism. That's the public declaration. You don't do this in secret. You don't do this alone. You always do it in this setting of the church and the power of the gathered people, whether it's around a lake, a stream, a pool. It doesn't matter. It's not the building that's holy. Buildings are not holy. Buildings are not sanctuaries. We are now the sanctuaries, and we bring Jesus into it. This just allows us to symbol with a little comfort and being able to hear and things be done in order that we can all understand. But what would be an application? How do we get in the presence of Jesus? Well, one of the application points is you should try to make gathering together on the weekend a priority. And it's not because I want you at church. I want you to be closer to Jesus. And something happens. It says even where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. Well, we, how do we come into, you know, we bring him all. We always are in the presence of Jesus because he's there. But God made a promise, Jesus did, that said when you get two or three of you who are in me and I am you, something supernatural starts happening when you gather and when you pray and when you worship. So something happens when you come here. I don't know about you, but I go home stronger and more empowered and more happy. And it's great to see a face or two and just celebrate Jesus. But you get into his presence by being in his word and reading his words and listening to his words, the teaching of his words. Just like this sermon and message today. You get into it by talking to him and praying to him and spending time with him. You get into his presence by being in a small group. But not only did... This Peter rebound from a failure because he changed things, and that key one thing was Jesus' presence. But the second thing that happened with Peter was he cooperated with Jesus' plan. That Jesus had a plan, and that's what he did. He just followed the plan because Jesus said, put out into the deep water. You know, so many times we want to stay in the shallow water. We want to stay in where it's calm. We want to stay in where we know we got our foot on the ground. You know, something about that that happens. You know, like you're, you know, you know, like when you're out in the big ocean and the, you know there's thousands and thousands of feet. Somehow that seems worse. But anything over the top of your nose, it's as bad. Amen. And so here he is getting into the deep water, but he's responding to his plan. In other words, I'm going to go because you said go. Go into this, this deep water. You know, most of us want to avoid that. But when we think about that, we're seeing a picture. We've got to overcome our fears. When we cooperate with Jesus' plan, there's always a place of fear. And that's really what we have to overcome. And it made me think of this woman, another woman, who had to really put action to her faith. And it was the woman with the issue of blood. As I was thinking about this story, I think sometimes we miss the points. And part of the reason we miss the points, we don't spend enough time in the Word, or we don't try to find the culture and understand their culture of what was there. 
That's why we're always around here at Love of Christ trying to understand the culture so we can communicate through to the culture to reach the next generation. But what we see here is you see some, this woman, and she had an issue of blood. She had bleeding coming from her body that would not stop that was ongoing, and we kind of look at that, well, she just needs a healing. No, it was bigger than that. Because in that culture, in that day, under the Jewish law, the law said anyone who has an issue of blood, that's what it's written in, in the law, is declared unclean. And if that person that has this issue, they're to isolate themselves, almost like being a leper, because they were concerned that it would be disease. But it would also, they were isolated from the community. They were rejected because anyone they touched, everything they touched became unclean and unfit for God to use. Now here we see this woman, she comes into this story and she is moving into this realm of pushing through these people. And that's what I want you to be thinking about. Here's a woman who pushes into this crowd against the law. She's not to be in public. She's not to touch people. And not only does she push against people and touch people, just imagine she's touching the holy man of God, Jesus. By this time, Jesus and his miracles had been so powerful and evident that the crowds were pressing around him. And that's what another count we hear of this story. There were crowds that were so thick that when he was touched, he was like, how can you even know anybody touched you, Jesus? Everybody's pushing against you. So here she is pushing against people, touching them, but she's going to make the holy man of God. And they knew this man is different. They didn't quite know he was Christ, the promised one. They didn't know he was God, the Lord, but they knew something because they could see the evidence and they heard the power of his words. So just imagine if all of a sudden the holy man is touched by one who's unclean. Now he has to go through a whole ritual of isolating himself and cleansing himself and going away from the people. Can you imagine how the people would say, wait a minute, man, you messed the plan up. This, this service is like being messed up because of you, woman. We're going to kill you. This could cost her her life. Now, in that place, though, she's moving. So this, as we look into this story, we see it in Matthew 9 and verse 20. It says, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up from behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch him. She thought. Everybody say, she thought. You see, she thought, but she caught a thought. You see, a lot of times our thinking is not our thinking, but it is a God thinking. It is a word from God. It is a direction from God. It is a leading from God. And sometimes we forget that. It, she had a thought. She called a thought, and that thought was a God kind of thought. Just like Peter was in there, and, you know, he heard Jesus say, go into the deep. She's hearing something deep in her spirit. If I can just touch him, I know that I would be healed. And so many times people, you know, they say, and I've taught on how do you hear the voice of God and people are listening. But really, it's more than anything else. Very few times have I heard it where it almost see, it felt like it was voice. But it's always, see, he doesn't use our eardrums to talk to us because that is airwaves that are pushing against us. But you see, he's a spirit and he speaks to our spirit. Even our human mankind spirit that God has given you, that you came into this world with, that you are going to be an eternal being. Where we talked about, you will be eternally with him in heaven or you will be eternally with him in the other place without him in hell. And that's where God speaks to our inside person. And it sometimes sounds like our thinking. But the reason I know, and you, that's how you got to be in the word, you got to be in prayer, you got to learn, and you got to take these action steps when he says something, and you say, I don't know if this is you, God, but I'm going to respond. And when you do, you find out, wow, that was him talking, amen? You know, that's how you understand the voice of God and learn the voice of God. You got to listen to your father. You got to get close to him into his presence. You got to spend time with him. And sometimes, and most of the time, it will just come when you know it's a thought and it's a thought from God. And that's what she had. And so she was cooperating with God's plan, which was just to touch him. She said, 
I will be healed. Then Jesus turned around after she touched him. And when she, he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Be encouraged. You know, we missed the meaning of that word because I was like, why would he say be encouraged? I mean, yeah, be encouraged. Your, your, your sins are forgiven. Yes, be encouraged. You're healed. But I really see this again as I looked into that word. That word really means be in a state of courage. In other words, encourage. Don't be afraid. The real meaning of this rule is don't be afraid. The very same thing he had to tell Peter after his encounter of coming into his presence is don't be afraid. Something's about to happen. And that's what God wants you to hear, that as you're rebounding from your failure, you're afraid of the rejection. You're afraid of what people say. You're afraid that that defined you. You're afraid your life is over because of that divorce. You're afraid because of the doctor's report. You're afraid because of what your bank statement said. No, be encouraged and don't be afraid, says the Lord. When you understand what Jesus is saying to us and speaking to us, and he says, be encouraged, don't be afraid, your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. What kind of faith did she have? One that was visible, that demonstrated, that was powerful because it had action associated with it. It wasn't she just hoped for it, it wasn't something she just wanted. It was something that she heard from God with a thought that came into her spirit, and then she responded with action. If she just stayed home and said, well, God, I want to be healed here, and you know I can't go out, and you know I'll be embarrassed, or you know I can't talk, or you know I'm afraid, or you know my job, and you know my school, you know my community. No, you got to be, be listening to God. So this is, though, this is a kind of faith, though. This is not something we hope for or want or choose it's something they heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're out there wanting something, hoping something, and then say, you know, trying to take a step, that's not the kind of real faith that God is. He wants you to listen to him. We need to get into his presence. And then he promises us. And when we follow his plan, he wants us to stop being afraid. Because you say so, Jesus. Because you say so. Put into the deep water. And then he responded with, because you say so. So what is our next step? Number three is we got to act on Jesus' promises. You know, when he said, all right, Jesus, you said do this, I'm going to do it. I know it doesn't make sense. I know I'll probably be embarrassed. I know my crew is tired. I know they're going to probably say, man, that was a stupid thing to do. Go out there and fish just because he said so. You see, when Jesus says so, we say yes. Amen. Amen. You see, that's the difference in our lives. We don't sit at and analyze on why it's not going to work. We just follow the plan and act on his promises. You know, when you think of that, when we see even Peter later, when he already seen Jesus and all the miracles and many other things, they were in a great storm on this same lake, him and his disciples, uh, his other guys, all the other disciples and apostles. And then Jesus wasn't with them. He wasn't in the boat. And so they were about to fail, and they were in a storm so great, the waves so strong and powerful, they were about to go down. Here's professional fishermen that are afraid. That's a bad storm. And they see Jesus walking on the water to them. And you all know the story. I'm not going to go and tell that story in detail, but it was something the Lord wanted you to hear there. And when Peter saw him, we see it in Matthew 14, 28. Peter called to him. In other words, he engaged him again in a conversation. He was praying. He was talking. You can call it whatever you want. Is you're wanting to communicate. You're wanting to connect. And look what he wanted to do. Jesus, I want to go from my place in the boat of failure. I want to go into your presence. And I don't care how rough the storm is. I know I'm not going to fail. Amen. And he says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yes, come. You see, he, there was a word, a caught, a thought. But these are words coming from the mouth of Jesus. He said, yes, come. And so Peter went over the side of the boat, walking on the water towards Jesus. He was going towards his presence, towards his power, towards his place of safety and security. In the midst of the greatest storm of your life, sometimes the storms won't cease but God will hold you in that storm, amen? 
and that you walk towards him, you get into his presence, you act on his promises. And that's what he was doing. As I said before, it's when you hear God say something and then you respond with determined action, that's real faith. And that's what he did. He heard him call him on the water and he went towards him. Because sometimes people are like, well, just get out of the boat and start walking, and that's faith. No, that's presumption. <laughs> that's a hoping that you're going to somehow water turn hard. But Peter had a life-changing experience where he walked on the water because he responded to his prize. So what do we do? How do we apply that? I think you really need to spend time. That's why you spend time in the Word, because you meditate. You roll over in your mind. You memorize. You put in your heart all the promises of Jesus because he is true. He is faithful. All of God's promises, we hide them in our heart because they're the things that are going to get us through the storms of life. And when you pray, you spend time talking to him. But also, I want to encourage you, and the Lord really put this in my heart, spend time listening. You know, so many times we go into prayer, we have our form, we have our ritual, we have our words, or we have our list, and here's my list, God, check, 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 check. And then we get to the end and it says, okay, in Jesus' name, amen, see you tomorrow, amen. And God's saying, wait a minute, I wanted to say something. You got to listen. I just really want to encourage you, spend time meditating the word, rolling it over in your heart. And then as you do, God will catch a thought in your heart. And something will resonate with it. And you know that this is God speaking about that word and applying it to your life. Because you can act on his promises. And then number four, what happened with Peter? He went from failure to success. Because not only did he see that, he saw the success even when it was impossible, not the right time, not the right day. He was tired. He was exhausted. He pressed through. He did what Jesus said to do. He acted on him. He got into his presence. And guess what? There was a great harvest of fish. But then he said right after that, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. You're going to be a fisher of men. In other words, a catcher of men. And when you do that, things are going to change. You know, that's where we've got to carry out Jesus' priorities. Because he had a shift. Now, his shift went from being the fisherman, the professional fisherman, to the one who went after Jesus. And that's great. And that's not the calling of everyone. And not only a handful of people in the scriptures did. So that's not what you're, you're needing to hear today. What you need to do is that God wants to come in your workplace. Your platform of work is your ministry and your boat and your business and your place of work, wherever it might be, in your school, in your home, in your community. He wants to come in and be with you. And when he does, he turns that place into a place of ministry. It turns that place into a place of miracles. That's what I loved about being in the corporate world. I, I really miss it. Is I would get up on every morning. I was so on fire for Jesus and in love with him. I'd say, I worked for DuPont for almost 20 years. I'd get up and say, okay, Jesus, what are you going to do today? What do you want me to do? I, I'm just believing, God, you've got somebody that is going to need you today. And that somehow, Lord, I know they need you, but let me see it. Let me hear it. Show me. I'm going to do what you say do. I didn't do these things on my own. I'm going to do what you say do, Jesus. And boy, when I saw the doors open, when somebody comes to you and says, you know what, I'm really hurting because my marriage is about to go under. Or I've got a doctor's report, I could pray with them. I was the hardest worker there. I was the most determined. I was the most faithful. I didn't take time away because that's not honoring God either. I've told you all that. But when the moment happened, there was always a moment where you could be the instrument of Jesus in the mission of ministry in your work. So wherever you are, it is a, it's just your place. We take Jesus everywhere. And that's what Peter did. But Peter had his other call, and he stepped out. And when he did, he preached. He got filled with the Holy Spirit after Jesus died, and then he rose again. And then the Holy Spirit filled him. And the first message, gee, Peter goes out, this rough fisherman, he preaches to the people of Jerusalem. And they're from all nations and all tribes and all colors because everybody from around the world had come there to celebrate the Passover. And now when he's preaching, these thousands of people are listening to him, this powerful, uh, uneducated, not Torah uh, 
given, but just a man of God, full of the Holy Spirit, declares Jesus. And I had this scripture, and as I looked at it, it it's really a quite a few scriptures. But I wanted you to just see some of the key points. Because these few key points is all you need to take your work, your school, your community, and tell others about Jesus. And this is what Peter said. This Jesus was a man that was accredited, which means it was shown to be true by God because he did all these signs and wonders and miracles. That's history. You can go to historians and they say there was a man, Jesus, living and there was all kinds of miracles attributed to him. That's the recorded history, not the Bible. And he was proven by God. And then it said that God raised this Jesus to life and we're witnesses of this fact. It's a fact. It's not a hope. It's not a myth. It's not a story. It's a fact world and it's recorded. And there's proof and there's testimonies. There was witnesses that all saw this. It's a fact. Amen. Everybody say, it's a fact. Yeah. Say, it was proven. And then he says, and then God made this Jesus. God did. He declared it with his resurrection, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. Lord meaning supreme God, master, leader. He is God himself. The Lord is not just an easy turn that they flew around, but it meant he is God himself. And not only that, but he is the Christ. And we think that's his last name or something. But it wasn't. That was the name. That was the title that was given to the Messiah. The one who was promised for 4,000 years while the Jews were waiting from the very book of Genesis. And I told you, as Jesus was showing, as God was showing his bride coming out of the side of Adam. Here he was declared through every prophet, through Isaiah, through Ezekiel, through Jeremiah. He, they were declaring the coming of the Christ, the coming of Jesus, and it's true. And now this one has been proven. Here he is proven to be the one. Oh, and when the people heard this, they knew, and they said, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Amen. Turn away from your sins. Stop your sinful ways. But also that word means to change your mind, to go in a new direction, to turn away from the direction of the old law and where you're headed and all the rules and all the regulations and turn to Jesus. That you're to change your mind about how you receive salvation, which is now faith and faith alone. You're to change your mind that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Amen. And then what do you do? You follow it with a public demonstration of determined action. You be baptized. And that's what they did. It said 3,000 of them got saved. It's this message, 3,000 at once. Jesus loves big churches. Amen. And that's what he did. He birthed a humongous church right there in one message. And here's this man that says, don't be afraid, Peter. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch some men. And guess what? Just like this net almost broke, you're going to see a harvest so great, it will astound the world. And it did. It turned Jerusalem upside down. From that day, every thousands were getting saved. Repent and be baptized. That's what we're going to celebrate in a moment. A public demonstration. Always publicly demonstrating with assembled believers declaring and witnessing that this is a life change event, that they have been saved, that Jesus is Lord, that they've made that confession in their heart. And then they now are saying, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then I go into this water, it's like a grave. And now I'm going to go under. And God, I am being buried because I no longer live. I'm a dead to my sin, but then I'm being resurrected to new life that I might live for Jesus from this moment on and this is my public and eternal declaration of his lordship can we give God praise let us pray heavenly father we're so grateful your word is so powerful so amazing so revelation oh God I sense and feel that you have opened up heavens and declared your word to the people's hearts today and Lord, we thank you for that revelation and the power of Jesus and his salvation. And God, that you, Lord, are, we're going to align with your presence. We're going to align with your priorities. We're going to align with your purpose and declare Jesus as Lord to all around us. And now, God, we give you praise. And while we're still praying, you're here or you're at Middletown 
or you're watching online, maybe even months from now, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit's still there. He's putting a thought in your heart, and that is a God thought that you need to turn away from your sins, repent, and turn to Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen? So I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. If you want salvation today, wherever you are, let's pray, and let's encourage the church as we pray. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I turn to Jesus. I declare him. He is my Lord. He is the Christ. He is my Savior. And I follow him. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead that I might have life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God praise for every one of those decisions. If you made a decision today, I want to send you some helpful information to help you along your journey, your first next steps. You don't have to do anything. We're not going to call you. We're not going to bother you. But if you would take out a Connect With Us card at your campus, and if you would fill it out and just check that box, whatever decision you make, I'm committing or recommitting my life to Christ, I'll get that information. But more importantly, I'll be praying for you, and I'll be celebrating. We will be celebrating together. The angels in heaven are celebrating your decision now because you're now in destined for eternity in heaven with Jesus. And so if you'll do that, and drop it uh, in the uh, the bucket. Uh, if you drop it in the uh, containers at the doors or at the info center, then we'll make sure we get it at your campus. And if you're watching the line, just hit that connect button, and I'll make sure you get it wherever you are in the world. We'll make sure you get it and send it to you right away. God bless you.